This lecture focuses on network geopolitics. It follows on the heels of our work on territory, precisely because the ideas of network and territory are a little bit like the odd couple in the social sciences. Many claim that one is opposed to or radically different from the other, but when it comes to explaining how and why this is the case, the answers are often less than clear. As always, my goal in this lecture is to help clarify some of the key ideas, principles, and issues in the chapter. So, to that end, we'll start with some definitions and disambiguations and develop the relationship between networks and state structures. We'll then take what we've used and look at the issue of statism and anti-statism as a way of understanding networks as agents in global politics. And then finally, we'll get into the examples as Flint develops around peace movements and terrorism. As a reminder from last week, and to build upon what we were working on previously in this class, territory does not equal the nation state. This is something we went over multiple times in last week's unit, and it bears reiterating here. Territories can indeed be national state territories, but they don't have to be. There are multiple forms of territory, local, urban, regional, supranational, that do not look or act like a nation state. This is going to be important. I'm going to ask you to put this observation aside just for the moment. But this is going to be important as we move forward in this week's unit. The term network has a technical definition, the crossing of threads, wires, and so forth, but more generally is reserved as a descriptive term. Net-like, complex, non-hierarchical systems are all often characterized as networks. Left there, though, this doesn't tell us much. And we need to distinguish a little bit more carefully between different kinds of networks and the arguments we can make about them. This is a distinction between what I call ontological and epistemological networks. Ontology refers to the study of being. It is a branch of philosophy that is concerned with the reality of things in the world. Epistemology refers to the study of meaning. It names the different ways in which things acquire meaning for us and in which we attribute meaning to them. To put this differently, ontology is concerned with what is in the world. Epistemology is concerned with how we know the world. Obviously, both of these terms name valuable ways of looking at things, and I'm not trying to argue that one is intrinsically superior to the other. But, we do need to understand this in reference to networks a little bit. Is a network something that we've created to make sense of a confusing problem? Or is a network something that is really out there and that we need to understand and discover? Unsurprisingly, when you read about descriptions of, say, terrorist networks in media, these two ideas about what a network is often get confused. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean. This is a mind map of the history of philosophy. Yeah, it's really confusing, I know, but it's going to illustrate a specific point in the context of this lecture. It is a perfect example of an epistemological network. Why? Well, many of the philosophers named therein had no idea they were in a network with the others. It's pretty fair to say that Aristotle had no sense of being in a network of thought with Hegel, since they lived roughly 2,100 years apart. Even in the case of contemporaries, such as Noam Chomsky and Michel Foucault, they certainly knew each other, but it may be a bit of a leap to say that they were consciously forming a network with each other. The network here is a pedagogical tool to help us visualize relations between people and schools of thought. It is mainly epistemological. It helps us interpret the world. It doesn't really tell us much about how things really are. Now let's take another very different example. This is a, a clip from the film The Battle of Algiers and represents a period during the Algerian Civil War, the Algerian War of Independence, which took place between 1954 and 1962. France, of course, held Algeria as a colonial possession, and it had done so since roughly 1830. During the War of Independence, the French military was called in to restore order and break the Algerian resistance. In this clip, 
Colonel Matthew, the guy you see just over there in the image, explains the network structure of the, F of the FLN, or the National Liberation Front, the group that had been carrying out bombings and raids against French forces. Les seuls renseignements que nous ayons concernent la structure de l'organisation. Commençons donc par celle-ci. C'est une organisation à pyramide composée d'une série de sections. Les sections, à leur tour, sont formées d'une série de triangles. Au sommet de la pyramide est l'état-major. Le responsable militaire de l'état-major trouve l'homme qu'il juge apte et le nomme chef d'une section, numéro 1. Le numéro 1, à son tour, en trouve deux autres, numéro 2, Et numéro 3. Ainsi se forme le premier triangle. À présent, le numéro 2 et le numéro 3 trouvent deux hommes chacun. Numéro 4, 5, 6 et 7. La raison de toute cette géométrie est que chaque militant ne connaît de l'organisation entière que trois membres maximum. Son responsable qui le choisit et ses deux subordonnés qu'il a lui-même choisi. Les contacts se font uniquement par écrit. Voilà pourquoi... Nous ne connaissons pas nos adversaires, parce qu'en réalité, ils ne se connaissent pas entre eux. Les connaître signifie les éliminer. All right. This is a network, but it's a totally different kind of thing from what we discussed earlier. Here, it might be more accurate to speak of work nets rather than networks. It is the work of connection rather than the technological trick of connectivity that is interesting in this instance and is interesting to us in the social sciences. Simply taking states and adding computers or Twitter or Instagram or any other social media doesn't really make a network. This is the problem with network metaphors used a little bit too freely to explain geopolitical change like the phrases Twitter revolution or social media revolutions in Arab countries. This fetishizes the technological dimensions of networks and really doesn't do a lot to help us understand the problem. Well, one of the issues running through Flint's chapter is the relationship between networks and territories. It's tempting to see networks as a-territorial, or at least as lessening the significance of territory. This is the approach developed in much popular media, for example by New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman and other proponents of globalization. Well, it may be cool to speak of the end of territory or the end of space, but analytically, I think it's a huge mistake. First, obviously, no one lives in the world in general. We all live in places, and those places exist in the physical world. Second, the targets of networks are usually quite territorial. Peace networks or policy networks seek to change national policy or a set of policies or to force an action on the part of a state. Obviously, territory isn't irrelevant in their minds. But third, think back to for a moment to our film in this unit. The banlieues are territories. The police operate as a network sharing information and intelligence to ostensibly combat the problem of delinquency in the banlieues. The increasing intensity of network policing doesn't do anything to reduce the territorial dimension of life in the banlieues. In fact, quite the opposite. As policing becomes more focused on information and technology, the banlieue might be ever more segregated from the larger city around it. We can extend this basic idea to the use of drones in the Afghanistan-Pakistan border regions, or policing border regions where migrants might cross. Networks, and this is a key idea, can disrupt existing territorial organizations. They can also quite easily make the territorial organization of politics, or of violence, more and not less intense. It all depends on context, and it all depends on the kind of network and the kind of situation we're examining. Well, for a long time, networks were assumed to be the opposite of state-sanctioned forms of organization. I'm just going to go over this very quickly. For Mackinder, Ratzel, and all of those other classical geopoliticians we talked about earlier, the state was the highest and most sophisticated form of political organization and expression on Earth. Networks, if they were considered at all, were thus identified with so-called fifth columns, 
groups of people who lo whose loyalties ostensibly lay elsewhere and who threaten the internal cohesion of societies. Unsurprisingly, Jews, Roma, and other more or less stateless people were frequently associated with such behavior. After World War II, this began to shift. Flint identifies how growing trends towards democratization, a global value more or less, the integration of economic, political, and social spheres, shared transnational concerns like environmentalism or peace or nuclear non-proliferation, and transnational institutions created the context for action at new scales. For example, under international law, the individual more or less doesn't exist. States and not people are the subject of international legal agreements. For transnational social movements, individuals are hugely important, for example, in mobilizing anti-war protests. Flint does a nice job of laying out the relationship between transnational social movements and geopolitics, and the work of building a network that's involved in that process, pay some careful attention to this. Well, enough theory, let's move into some examples. Here I've constructed a working timeline of key events in the development of the global peace movement. Some are covered by Flint, others are pieces of the puzzle that I thought interesting to add in. Basically, we can see each of these movements in terms of their historical progress. One builds on the other but also in terms of their networkness, or the extent to which they helped build, or were the outcomes of existing networks. Of mixed policy shifts, the League of Nations, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, with ideological shifts, such as Gandhi's Salt March and a few influential documentary films. The Salt March, on the surface, was a protest against the British salt monopoly, led by Mahatma Gandhi and a number of other Indian activists. Dig a little deeper, though, and it was actually part of a wider anti-colonial network designed to challenge the legitimacy of colonial rule and weaken colonization, not only in India, but in lots of places around the world. Neighbors, a short film from the National Film Board of Canada, was widely shown in the 1950s and seen as an allegory for untrammeled arms buildups. It won an Academy Award and was later named to UNESCO's list of the most significant documentary heritage collection films in the world. In the midst of anti-nuclear mobilization, such as the Committee on Nuclear Disarmament and the European Nuclear Disarmament Conventions, respectively CND and END over there on the timeline, documentary film, If You Love This Planet, had a tremendous effect on people's awareness of global issues and problems and was widely shown on college campuses in the 1980s and 90s, where I first saw it. The nuclear freeze movement that came out of the CDN and END and a whole series of other peace movements reached a kind of tidal wave in the early 1980s with large-scale mass protests in favor of the so-called nuclear freeze. This then created the context for the negotiation of the START treaties, a set of bilateral nuclear arms reduction treaties between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The context in which this occurred was one of widespread support for nuclear disarmament pushed by an increasingly global network of groups and organizations. Evidently, they weren't seen as traitors in the fifth columns anymore. The idea of networks as constitutive elements of politics was becoming increasingly normalized. Conventional histories of START, the treaty negotiated by President Reagan and Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev, tend to emphasize the characters and the personalities of those two leaders. Surely those were important aspects. My interest is in understanding the ways in which wider elements of the context help shape the conditions under which those negotiations took place. Dealing with the history of the peace movement and dealing with networks of anti-nuclear activism is one way of untangling this broader picture, which I think is really powerful and really interesting. On the next slide, I've broken down some of those same elements that you saw on the previous timeline, roughly both historically, 
and in terms of the intensity of their networkness, for lack of a better term. There's nothing fixed about this particular trajectory. Indeed, others could propose different ways of breaking this down and different ways of organizing this. But a back-of-the-envelope analysis suggests that the general intensity of networkness and anti-war movements has increased over time. Judging by such metrics as participation in global conferences, geographically distantized, the discourses of different groups, and other tools. The general trend is upward, but note that it's also fairly uneven. I've placed the SALT march fairly high on the index of networkness for reasons I described in the previous slide. Alternately, other tools like the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty rank a little bit lower precisely because they are very much bracketed in the context of bilateral state-to-state -state diplomacy. Finally, the landmines ban of 1997 was a truly global effort, since by the 1990s there were a great many groups of doctors, peace activists, military veterans, and politicians eager to push forward a ban on so-called anti-personnel landmines, in other words, the kinds of landmines are designed to kill or disable individuals, as opposed to the anti-carrier landmines designed to blow up tanks and jeeps and this sort of thing. We can do much the same thing with regards to terrorism. Flint does a nice job of laying out the historical evolution of terrorist networks. The description and analysis he provides is generally sound, but a few remarks are in order here. First, Networks are embedded within larger goals of terrorist activity, for example, nationalism or anti-imperialism. Second, terrorist networks may sometimes transcend the state, but this is not always the case, especially since the branches of many organizations are very much based in states and in national politics. For example, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb has sought to destabilize and challenge national governments in Algeria and Mali. Finally, the geographical mismatch between the organization of networks and the desire of politicians to drum up support for anti-terrorism creates issues of its own. Most obviously, the U.S. after 9-11 invaded two countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, in the goal of defeating terrorist networks that were quite obviously capable of picking up and moving elsewhere, and of course, in some respect, they did exactly that. Indeed, the desire to put a name and a face to terrorist activity, to peg it to a specific set of actors and a specific set of countries, has had some interesting consequences. Back in the early days when the Bush administration emphasized finding Osama bin Laden as the top priority, the New Yorker published a cartoon, which I think does a very nice job of highlighting this, the agents of the state groping for new ways to find a single person, part of an elusive network, in a proverbial haystack of foreign countries. The underlying point is, I think, very germane to our discussion. When states are only committed to seeing one particular way or to seeing a problem organized on a state-by-state -state basis, they are blind to alternative ways of organizing politics and, of course, violence and terror. Well, to wrap this up, the point underlying the description of Hoffman's work basically is that there are all kinds of new ways, new strategies, new techniques through which we can think about terrorism geographically and in which we can develop and understand possible responses to this. A more flexible geopolitical imagination does indeed emerge at times, such as in the case of cyber warfare, and Flint spends some time describing this, or the incorporation of peace movements and activists into mainstream politics. Finally, I'm going to leave you with a little quotation from Flint's text on page 192, which I think is very nicely germane to what we're discussing here. States have traditionally identified their allies and enemies or opportunities and threats in terms of other states. But this calculation may well become increasingly irrelevant or incomplete as various forms of networks come to the fore. Geopolitics will need to develop ways of critically assessing how and why territory and networks interact to form new political circumstances.
Keep this in mind, it will be relevant both to next week's unit and to the final test coming up also in a very short period of time.